show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a very exciting and technical difficulty full VFX and chill. Uh, I am Rashi, and here with me is the great Zalam himself, Michael Zalabski, live from the airport near Adobe Max, where I believe for the last little while you've been attending Adobe Max. Michael, is that so? That is true. I've been hanging out at the Maxon booth showing off all the cool things in the Red Giant Tools at Cinema 40. That is incredible. Was it zany to the max? Is that their, is that their slogan there? I know I can't hear you. Excellent. Oh, no. Wonderful. Let's see. Love you. Technical difficulties. Bye-bye. Technical difficulties are fun. Uh, that ambient sound you're hearing is probably from... Uh, an exciting terminal in LAX or something as Michael Zlavsky tries to escape the City of Angels. Um, please let me know in the chat if you can hear me and if you can hear Michael when Michael is talking. Uh, I believe that uh, Michael can possibly not hear me, which I'm trying to remedy at the moment. So uh, hopefully we'll get that well, sorted I, out. I, I, can, I can only hear you on YouTube, so you are delayed by a few seconds. Oh, that's hilarious. Let me see if uh, this would let me uh, do this at all. Uh, Just one moment, everybody. Thank you for bearing with me as we attempt to uh, do that. Um, Can you hear me now, Michael? Maybe? Maybe not? Yeah, I was was not supposed to be able to make it today, but I'm here in the airport. (laughs) And... uh, it's my fault. All these types of difficulties. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, Michael, can you hear me? Maybe. Maybe not. Oh, no. This is so terrible. Uh, this is the exciting world of live streams, everybody. Uh, I do not know why my sound yeah, is Yeah, I can going. hear you now. You can hear me now? Oh, now you uh, stopped. I stopped. Uh, that's confusing. I have no idea why. I also don't know if I'm coming in twice as loud now that Michael can hear me. It's always exciting. But uh, please let us know in the chat how messed up on a scale of one to bleeding ears uh, the audio setup is here. Excellent. So while we wait for our uh, chat to respond, uh, Michael, why don't you let us know a little bit about uh, what you got to see there at Adobe Max? Do you guys jump in? What? This is ridiculous. I don't know what's happening now. Let's see. One moment. Oh, my gosh. There's a stretched out Seth. <laughs> what is happening? That is wild. Okay. I'm going to see if I can uh, plug in a few uh, weird wires over here and figure out what uh seth you're hidden behind uh your uh your other self why let's see thank you for being with me am i on the show you're you're on the show now oh Oh, yeah yeah, we we can't can't hear hashi Hashi, can can we? we what i think that you two cannot hear me but i'm assuming the stream can which is right it's not coming into skype so uh, I'm going to see if I can figure out. Well, I don't know how to do that. Uh, yeah, we, we can hear you, we can hear you on YouTube. Oh. Uh-oh. Uh, now Seth is, has become the Skype logo. This is going phenomenally well. <laughs> Seth, you've never looked better than you do live on the stream right now. It's perfect. Um, yeah, I... I this is wild. I believe that I can hear you too. And uh, uh, some people are asking Seth, why, why the wide face? I don't know what no, is going on with Seth's face. This is interesting. So, uh, as the title hinted at today, uh, both Michael and Seth were not going to be available. And so when I was plugging in all the wires to the uh, switchboard <laughs> at the, the chill station, um, I may have not had them all plugged in until the minute I started broadcasting, which is exciting. It's lots of fun. Oh, uh, let's see. So still, 
I'm getting lots of messages from my co-host that they can't hear me, but I believe that you all can hear me on the stream, I think. Uh, but uh, if my friends here on the show are trying to listen to me, they are hearing it delayed by 20 seconds or so. And uh, I appreciate everybody's patience while I try to see if I can make it so uh, we could have some kind of uh, reasonable conversation here. Audio and video microphone... I let's see. Can you hear me now, Seth and or Michael? <laughs> this is wild. This is a very effective television. It it looks to me. You see, here's the confusing thing for me is on my end. Don't know how this will look if I try to switch over now. Um. I see, I, I think that I see my audio coming through to the Skype call for y'all to hear. I'm showing this live on the stream so everybody can see the exciting behind the scenes bit. It's so weird. Default communication device. It's either this microphone or the other one. What if I say don't automatically adjust? What, if, what is, does that do anything? Thank you, my lovely audience. I'm so sorry that uh, y'all can hear me and my, my other co-hosts cannot. This is it's weird. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm streaming live the, uh, what looks to be my audio signal going through. I just don't know why it's not uh, heading over. Ah. All right. Well, anyway, uh, I'm going to move on to some uh, other weird stuff. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm going to try. I'm uh, I'm jumping off of Skype, uh, my friends. I'm now just talking to my co-hosts through this show. Uh, I'm just going to close Skype because I don't I don't like what it's trying to do here. So let's close that down. And uh, in the meantime, I'm going to switch over to what is hopefully uh, just me hanging out here. And I'm going to see if I can reconnect my friendos. All right, everybody. This is what you came here for. The exciting world of stuff. Michael, can you hear me now that I've restarted Skype? I'm guessing no. That's a, that's I can only a no. hear you on YouTube. I do not hear you. Can only hear Skype's. me on YouTube? What the heck? Makes no sense to me. I can see my my audio signal on Skype. How about now? Can you hear me on Skype? Can Seth hear me on Skype? Still only YouTube. Still only YouTube. Very very bizarre. I have noise cancellation off. I have my microphone blaring. Uh, I'm trying this now. Did that change anything? I'm changing this now. Did that change anything? I don't know. This is silly. Yep. I'm just going to switch on over to uh, doing this show, everybody, because I love you all, and I love my co-hosts, too, and I, for some reason, cannot uh, get my audio over to them. Anyway, uh, today, uh, you might have noticed that our season four intro was the same as uh, the exciting uh, intro we had last week. Uh, I was in the middle of building an exciting new uh, intro for this week to go along with one of my themes, which is to show off a cool animation tool that I have for anybody who does uh, 2D or 2.5D animation compositing. I have a fun little tool that I'm going to demonstrate for you all. But I uh, did not get around to finishing my update of my, uh, whatever you call it, our, uh, our bizarre conquest to have a unique intro every week. Um, but I will finish it off because I'm excited with where it's going. But um, today I'm going to show off uh, this thing, which uh, hopefully I can switch over to sharing my screen now. Uh, hopefully you can all see my lovely After Effects setup now. And these two, uh, this saber-toothed tiger and this, uh, I don't know, Ankylosaurus or whatever they're called. Uh, 
Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to show off a cool thing. If uh, you've ever worked in the world of 2D animation compositing before, one of the weird situations you can get into is you'll have animation that comes in on ones, which means if your animation is 24 frames per second, that you have one new frame per frame. It's on ones. Um, but sometimes you might do things on twos, which means you're playing every frame for two frames at a time. And this would definitely matter if you're doing like an action sequence or something, or there's some complicated movement. You might want to animate that on ones. But if somebody's standing still and just talking, you might force their body to just twos or threes or any kind of hold and some variable things like that. So uh, one of the weird issues that I noticed was that you might have something like this. So let me just solo this animation. This is all uh, faked, I guess. Uh, but here's the idea. So here's a little animated sequence. Tiger jumping around fighting this thing. Uh, parts of this are uh, like one frame per frame. Parts of it are two frames playing in a row. But the point is it's variable. So you can see as I step through the frames, it's holding and then it advances, and then it holds, advances, hold, 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 advance. And it's variable. It's not like it's exactly 12 frames per second the whole time. And so one of the weird issues you can get into when you're trying to composite uh, additional digital components into uh, some kind of traditional animation pipeline like this is you might have, you know what the camera movement is that you use as the reference for this 2D animation. And here... I have this checkerboard to kind of represent what that could look like. But you'll see as I press play, the ground is moving completely smoothly, but the characters are a little bit stuttery. And you get into this weird situation where if the background is updating every frame, you'll get these moments where the background is sliding and then they're holding still, and then you get this mismatch, this kind of stuttery feel, which is a little bit annoying. And so uh, what I have here is this exciting little script right here called the Animation Frame Detector. And if any of you would like it, I have uh, it right here. Uh, yes. Available at this lovely link right here. So if you'd like to try it out, bit.ly, frame detect, or you can scan this QR code at some point. I'll make it, I'll make it nice and big like that for a moment. All right, enough of that. Back over to this animation thing. Here is what this uh, silly little script does. Uh, I'm going to solo down to just my animation layer. And you highlight that layer, whichever has your animation on it. And in this case, it's these two guys fighting. And like I said, it's variable frame rate. So if I click on this button, identify unique frames... Uh, it should run pretty simply. So nothing super obvious yet, but uh, here's what's happened. Uh, whenever there is a new frame, I put this little indicator up that says, this is a new frame. And then if I step forward, this is not a new frame, not a new frame, not a new frame. And then this is a new frame. And so as you go through, it identifies each new frame, which is kind of cool. So that way you can kind of have some kind of reference as to when this image changes. But that's just the detector feature of it. So that takes this whole uh, piece of footage, and what it's doing is it's comparing every frame to the frame before it, figuring out based on a tolerance of a difference between the two frames if it's a repeat of the same frame or if it's a new frame. And so then this took a little while to figure out. Uh, I've created this exciting thing, which is create a posterize adjustment layer. So if I click that, you will now add uh, this adjustment layer right here called the frame rate matcher. And now I'm going to unsolo everything. And so we can see, uh, whoops, it's, it's hiding layers actively. So I'm going to do that. Um, so here we go. So now we have this top level adjustment layer up here. And what it's going to do is when there's a new frame followed by a repeat frame, it will actually hold everything in frame. So notice now that as I frame forward, the ground plane is only advancing when 
the animation advances. All crazy automatically, which is pretty cool. So this could be a variable frame rate. You could have as many holds as you wanted. And now when I play through, the background and the ground plane only move if the animation is moving on that frame. So you'll notice that now their feet are a lot more locked to whatever position they're in because they're only updating every so often. And this is something that I wish that I had thought of when <laughs> we were doing tons of this kind of work uh, at DreamWorks. Uh, and so that's a fun little... Uh, and that's basically the gist of what the script does. One of the exciting uh, things that I got to use for this script that I'd never really played with uh, for this purpose before uh, was on this adjustment layer, I'm using... Um, you'll notice there's this little... Uh, this is just a slider value that I'm pulling from when you run the frame detector. Uh, it's either a zero uh, when there's a new frame or uh, one when it's... Uh, repeat frame. And based on that number that switches back and forth to kind of identify what's going on, I have a time warp effect. And the time warp effect is sourcing a whole frame, uh, and it adjusts the time that it shows the whole screen um, based on a source frame number. And this source frame number has a little expression in it. And that this expression is basically... Uh, look at the last uh, several frames up to the last 24 frames and check what the indicator value was. How many times did the frame change during that? Um, and if it sees that it's as soon as it realizes there's a change, it plays that live frame of everything. And then if you, as long as it's giving you a repeat frame, it holds on that frame minus however many frames until it sees a new frame, which is pretty cool. I was trying to do this a while ago with like uh, linking a uh, variable slider to a posterized time, but unfortunately the way uh, posterized time uh, would work is that uh, it starts from whatever your frame zero is and uses that as the basis for its count the whole way through. So you'll get repeat frames and it'll jump back and show previous frames, but time warp, uh, as Brigby Chillweather mentions, you know, it's just a jump to the left or a jump to the right. And, you know, uh, that's uh, very fun. That's, that's as much of the song as, I, as I'm going to try to talk through. Um, Michael, I, <laughs> I feel so terrible that you're there, but delayed. Oh, uh, let me see there. Uh, I'm going to pull up a... Oh, where's my group chat? Okay. Uh, if you ever want to make it run on twos, check out this tip. Ooh. Let me see. So I'm going to pull that up. I'm pulling it up live. Hey, I know this guy. What did you do for this, Michael? Do you want to describe it? I realize you'll hear my question 20 seconds after I say it. Really, why not? Um, oh, yeah, you're not visible. Boo. I'll bring, I'll bring back this exciting frame where I think that you're audible. So well, basically, I'm just animating the physics time factor to jump forward the number of frames and then hold. Oh, that's perfect. And in fact, uh, <laughs> I should have coordinated with you on this because <laughs> accent. So, so I built into. Uh... Oh, perfect. Look at this. Michael's pointing out that, look, you can, we have captions right here. Showing exactly how it was done. Wonderful. So you're using the physics time factor and adjusting that. 
uh, whenever it's on twos. And I actually used the same technique uh, in here. Uh, I knew that it was possible that particular would be one of the things that you'd be using with something like uh, this crazy uh, frame rate matcher situation. Uh, so if you do have the posterized time adjustment layer, then it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's automatically posterizing any effects you have, including particular uh, below it. But say you're doing something like a character is supposed to emit little, you know, particle trails, uh, and it's on twos, you can follow Michael's advice. And if it's a variable frame rate, uh, you don't need this adjustment layer. You can actually, uh, just from here, if you've already run the identify unique frames, you can say push to particular only. Uh, and I note here in this description that it'll apply uh, an expression to the physics time factor in particular. But this will reduce the particle count, which is kind of bizarre. So uh, I'll say push to particular only. And you'll see that down here uh, on my particular layer, it's added this uh, lovely, it really is just the, uh, the indicator value divided by 100 uh, is pushed to the physics time factor. And so basically if it's playing a new frame, then it'll, it'll play it here, which is kind of cool. Uh, but because it's every now and then not uh, emitting for a full frame, you actually do get fewer total particles over time because it's like you're having the opportunities for new particles to spawn. So if that's not your desired effect, then you can remove that uh, effect, leave it at one, and just stick with the top-level posterized frame, which will match your animation. All right, I'm just catching up with the chat a little bit. Uh, this was the exciting thing that I <laughs> actually had planned out in any way to show. Uh, and I'm, I feel so, so terrible that, my, uh, that I'm unable to pass my audio along <laughs> to my friends on Skype here. It's the most bizarre thing ever. But uh, I cannot, I, I apparently don't know how to fix it. I'm, I'm not... I'm not a uh, some kind of crazy uh, noise engineer. That's very silly. Uh, let's see, Michael, can you hear me live if I switch it to this thing? I've tried like everything that I can think of. <laughs> switch this to. Does that do anything? Am I live? No. Oh well. All right. Anyway, um, I'm just gonna switch back to. Uh, uh, some other exciting uh, Friday the Thirteenth uh, era things. See, that's the re that's the problem. It's a we're we're on a bad luck day here. So uh, let's see. I'm uh, we have a lot of questions in the chat about uh, our licensing and education licensing, which I actually am not qualified to answer. I I truly uh, do not know the answer, but I do know that it is something being discussed and being brought up by a lot of people. Uh, so, um, Michael, if you hear this uh, delayed answer and you have any uh, better answer, I feel like all I know right now is that uh, it's, a, it's a concern being worked on and I don't actually have an answer for you. I feel bad about that. But anyway, there's that. Oh, and Ryan has asked, whatever happened to that 3D plane stamp 2.0? Uh, what likely happened is we went on summer break and I probably never got it uh, properly updated to people. Is that, does that sound about right? Um, let me see here. Uh, since you've got me on the hook, I might as well uh, try to see if I can pull it up. Let's see. We got 3D plane stamp 2.0. We think version 3. Do you think that was the most recent one? Let's see. Uh, still PNG pre-comp and live pre-comp. Let's... Let's do something about that right now, Ryan. Uh, let's see. Okay, the... Uh, all right, it looks like uh, Red Giant will address uh, some of that question in the chat, which is great. Thank you, Michael. And uh, as your other moniker of the Red Giant... 
uh, I'm going to uh, open up my fun little uh, bin of scripts here and try to see if uh, see if I for sure have the latest and greatest of my uh, of the 3D Plane Stamp 2.0, and then I can pass that out to you all because uh, y'all deserve it. You've you've been waiting a long time. Script, Nate, scripts. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. Okay, none of those are the updated one. 3D Plane Stamp. Really, it's not one of these? Okay, 3D Plane Stamp with 32-bit. Hmm. All right, into extend script we go. Recent files. Oh, it's not one of my recent files either. Well, that's just silly. Uh, maybe I had it in our in our finale folder. Is that where I might have put it? Oh no, that was Seth's breakdown. Um, script and did I put it in our bunch of tools folder this is so exciting everybody I feel like this is going even better than I had hoped for thank y'all for your patience oh I made an output folder that's very silly outputs yeah, 2.0, version 3. All right, let's copy this link, and let's make it uh, more palatable for everybody here. Let's open up my After Effects to show in the background here. Actually, no, I'll switch to, uh, what do we got? There we go. Y'all can look at my my lovely face in a giant, giant format while I uh, make this into a prettier link that I can share with you all. All right, let's say, uh, do, 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 do. All right, let's make a little little bitly link of this uh, 3D plane stamp. What should we call it? I'll call it 3D stamp two. There's, hopefully that's unique enough. It is unique enough, lovely. Okay, so now we have two scripts to share with you. We've got, let's ignore this uh, this thing here. Let's duplicate that, and we're going to say we now have a 3D stamp 2. There you are, everybody. The long-awaited, uh, probably promised at the finale or maybe our bunch of tools uh episode of vfx and chill uh here is uh the updated 3d plane stamp which i believe uh if i can uh let's see well, let's save that why not we'll double check that it does what it's supposed to do ae projects um new batch Street sample, testing. Who knows what I might have tested this with. Testing, nine. Let's try it. Since we're sharing that link, I'll show a little example of what that script does. All right, so uh, the way the 3D plane stamp tool works uh, is you might have... Uh, a piece of footage like this, and you will take your uh, After Effects 3D camera tracker and run it on that piece of footage, and you get some nice tracking points like that. Now, one of the natural things that I would always want to do is to be able to take these 3D tracking points, uh, find maybe a section like this door or something like that, and I'll just find a nice little frame and say, I kind of want this area... And then I can right-click and say, create a solid. And that will create a little solid for me right here. 
And once I have that solid, I could take it and kind of align it in the direction that I want. And then I'll run that uh, new version of the script here called 3D Plane Stamp 2.0. It formats itself a little bit weird. I don't know why that is. It's like this wasn't made by an expert. <laughs> um, so uh, the way 3D Plane Stamp works is you now click on this 3D tracking solid and there are several options. There's a still PNG version, which is the fastest. And if you're just doing something for the web or something really straightforward, this is what I would recommend. Uh, you just press the 3D stamp button and it'll think for just a second and re-import uh, a little PNG in place of the solid that was there. And what's neat about this PNG is it's the texture of whatever that video frame was. So now that is right there, 3D tracked into your scene. So it's 3D tracked right behind the guy right there. So one of the issues that we were running into is that we realized that this was a nice uh, HD comp. Uh, it was an 8-bit, and that's what I tested the script with, but a lot of people were working with a lot better footage than this. Uh, 4K footage and higher depth rates, and this was exporting a PNG because that was the easiest way to... Uh, save something, you, there's actually a function in After Effects to export a PNG directly from the composition bypassing the render queue entirely. Uh, but there isn't for anything higher than a PG, PNG. So you can't do like a TIFF or anything with a higher depth rate. And so we built in this HQ delay in case you're working with higher resolutions, uh, but still want to use a PNG. Uh, but then another option we came up with was uh, we'll just repeat the process, basically. Uh, a Instead of a still PNG, you could say a still pre-comp. And if I say still pre-comp, and then press the 3D plane stamp button, it functions just like before. It looks like you're getting this little layer here. But instead of a rasterized uh, PNG, this is actually a pre-comp of all of your stuff unstretched here. So it'll preserve whatever your project dip depth rate uh, is and everything. In this case, it's still the 8-bit. But if you had, you know, 32-bit or if it was log footage or something weird like that, uh, you could have, you'd have all of that ported nicely back into here, preserving the color space. And then uh, the experimental mode uh, has this live pre-comp button right here. So I'll delete the previous pre-comp, show this solid again, and what live precomp does uh, is kind of what you would guess. Uh, it's a lot like the still precomp, but it'll look like nothing is happening, right? And that's because this piece of footage is being updated with the texture that you would see from this angle of this footage. But if you were at some other weird angle like this, you can kind of see that what's happening is it's doing this kind of reverse lockdown bit of just that piece of footage and sticking it right onto that cube. So you'll see that as the camera is moving out of it, there's no data to show there, but it feels a lot like uh, if you're doing a four-point lockdown of this piece of footage that is uh, not like that. It, everything is moving in this piece of footage, but this little pre-comp, has everything nicely locked down. So if you see the pre-comp here and you scroll through it, it's holding relatively still. So if you wanted to use this pre-comp to say like add something in here that says, uh, I don't know, uh, enter or something like that, you could put a little text layer here in this pre-comp and then when you jump back over into your alley sample, it's projected onto the wall right there. Not cute. Anyway, uh, that's uh, that's three D plane stamp, everybody, and uh, let me double check with how everybody in the chat is doing. Oh, am we? Let's see. Am I? I somehow cannot see my chat anymore. Everyone's leaving me today.
Let's see. Now I'm hoping that I'm that I'm properly <laughs> streaming to people. Let's see here. I'm going to be awkwardly silent a second again while I uh, try to figure this out. I hadn't. Okay, great. Uh, Michael is confirming via chat that uh, I am still streaming. Uh, Restream logged out inside of OBS for me is what happened there for context in the future. Um, Let's see. Uh, Yay or Yee by Design is saying, thank you for being in Hashi. You really love seeing the master at work. Was wondering if you guys could cover tracking natively in Cinema 4D. No! No, I will not. Actually, no. I, that, that's definitely something that we could do. Uh, tracking in Cinema 4D is something that uh, can be very helpful, especially if you're uh, doing something that is slightly more complicated than uh, just a nice, uh, clean hallway or something like that. Um, I feel like, see, oh, I also have a Jason Murphy request for Whirly Scripts, uh, which we'll, we'll, we'll get there at some point. So, uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, yeah, the Whirly Scripts will be live and then everyone will be able to work like our very own Seth, the Whirly Bird, Whirly. That, I'm, well, I'm workshopping that nickname. And obviously without the audio input of my co-hosts to help, that's what it shall remain. Uh, so uh, tracking in uh, Cinema 4D, which I feel like I might demonstrate poorly here. Let's see. Let's try it out here. So here's how it works. Right up here in the top menu of Cinema 4D, uh, which, by the way, if you didn't see last week or haven't been paying attention to any random Maxon training team or Maxon announcements, there are new versions of Cinema 4D out, and you should update both Cinema 4D and anything available in your Maxon app because it's uh, it's wonderful. There's lots of cool updates. It makes the, the latest Cinema 4D update, I really feel like is, is like they've done a lot of weeding of things that were slowing down the program, and just about like every corner of the program has stuff that works a little bit faster, and that's just so nice. I like when we're able to do kind of things like that. So uh, check it out, update to uh, 2024. And then uh, just like in uh, previous versions, you can go to the tracker menu here and you can say motion tracker. That puts this motion tracker object right here into your project. And you'll see that down here in the attributes, there's a, oh, uh, maybe you won't because of my face. Let me see here. I'm just going to move over here. Let's hop around for here and let's see. Where is it? Now I can look over here. Uh, so there's this little footage section. And I can click on the footage folder right there. And let me load up one of those uh, demo pieces of footage that I was using in the last thing. Um, this parkour one, maybe. All right, so here's this parkour piece of footage. It's actually broken up into a TIFF sequence. You could load up a uh, piece of footage as well into here, but I'm going to work with the uh, TIFF sequence just for a nice, clean, frame-by-frame -frame reading. So I've loaded in that just by clicking on the very first one. And now, down here, you'll notice that it kind of automatically gathered that it was frame 0 through frame 176, which is great. So I believe that if I start scrolling through here, now you have Cinema 4D with footage in it. And it's not lovely. It just it's simple, straightforward. And uh, now there are a couple of different things you need to do. There is the two D tracking, and what two D tracking means is it is basically what all uh, tracking software does. It looks for high contrast points. It's going to try to do about three hundred random points that are minimally spaced, about nineteen pixels apart, and it's going to try to auto track that. So basically, it's going to do a 2D track of all of these little points to try to come up with a nice uh, little flow diagram. I'm just going to go ahead and say auto track forward and backward. And you'll see down here, it's thinking through that. Uh, processing, processing, processing. And here we are. Uh, so now, as I scroll through, you can see that it's tracked about 300 little 
points kind of throughout this piece of footage. And as I step through the frames, it's sort of recorded where they are. Now, this isn't the 3D track. These are all literally existing in 2D space. And so what happens next is you want to move from this 2D tracking that you've done and make sure that you kind of like what's going on. And I generally like what's going on. I like that there are points in the areas that seem to be moving. They seem to be generally tracking properly with the motion of the camera. If I were to look at any specific point, it looks like it's tracing it nicely. And if that all feels fine, that's wonderful. If you see these weird little errant ones that sort of are going off track, you're welcome to highlight and delete these kind of like jaggedy ones. Like this one probably got confused maybe by the reflection here, maybe by the character's head uh, moving through frames. So I could click on that point and delete it for higher accuracy or whatever. And you could do that to your heart's content, depending on how complicated your track is. The next thing you're going to do is switch over to the 3D solver. And here is where the 3D ness is going to come from. So now that you've already run your 2D tracking and it has those points to reference, you click over to 3D solve and can say, run the 3D solver on this. And now it's going to think for a little while. You can see down here in the bottom corner that it is running through to create, um, to try to look at all these points and see if it can come up with a 3D solution for all of them. So uh, I think we're, are we done? That's great. It's output this solved camera now. So if I switch from the solved camera to a different default camera, you can see that now all of my points are actually being projected in 3D. And from this, uh, from this view here, I can see that this is what it believes the camera is doing. Fun, right? And this one worked out exceptionally well. There's a, it, it, was, it worked really well because there's a lot of environment and a lot of, uh, and not a whole lot of subject interference. So if you were to look at the density of this little point cloud, it's basically like our little recreation of the side of the building and that little ramp and the little things that stick out like that. So you have all of these lovely uh, reference points. And here's where I get a little bit out of my depth in terms of uh, knowing how to properly place things. I know that I can grab the location of uh, any of these tracked points, but there are ways that you can select three of them and, and identify a plane and things like that. And I'm, I'm less familiar with how to do that. Michael is probably just screaming at me through, through Skype, but uh, that's all right. This is as far, this is where I'm going to get you. Uh, one fun thing that you could do from this point is you can always uh, save this as a Cinema 4D project and then uh, export it to after effects too to work with the same data here and after effects will do the same thing if i was working with this 3d tracked uh piece of footage like i think that i might even have it in in here uh you can do vice versa if you're more comfortable tracking in after effects you could take this 3d track and say file export uh cinema 4d exporter and what you'll get on the other end is, I'll just open this up here. Script from Nate, 3D stuff, and parkour sample. So check it out. Here is the same uh, little piece uh, with, uh, oh, it's, it's not updating frame by frame for this. So you'll have to ignore that a little bit. I'm going to turn off the background for a second because it's confusing. But uh, here, it actually has my 3D plane stamped pieces of footage and the After Effects tracked camera uh, right into here, which is pretty cool. And you'll notice that if I switch to a default camera, uh, this After Effects tracking camera probably looks pretty similar to the one that I got uh, in uh, Cinema 4D also. If I highlight that and look at its camera path. So yeah, those two came out pretty similar. It's a nice little question mark shaped thing. So there's there's two exciting ways to uh, share data between uh, two programs. Uh, Michael is mentioning in my own chat here <laughs> that um, there, there's also a, um, uh, 
uh, what you might call it, a, a reconstruction tool uh, built into the, uh, let's see, I'm going to, I can pull it up right here. Look at this all around me. Look, here's a reconstruction tool. Uh, so you can use uh, basically a point cloud of your scene to try to recreate something. If you've nicely uh, motion tracked something that, uh, especially if it has no, um, no obscuration thing is running through it. Look at this. All of this lovely detail, all available uh, here on the, the Maxon, the help.maxon.net, which is accessible probably from any of these tools. If you just right click on them here and say, hey, show me the help on uh, what the solved camera is all about. And now I can learn even more about things. Look at that. This reminds me a little bit of when uh, when you work in retail, uh, you're an expert at anything if you can read the box faster than the customer can. And that's how you become a, an expert at everything in your store. Retail tips uh, from Hashi. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, we're having fun, right? Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, I am probably just going to continue goofing off in this uh bizarre manner where I can I somehow am both with and not with my friends. I feel so bad that Michael is tuned in from the airport and uh, while he can speak live on the show, cannot hear it. It's the it's the the darndest thing. And I and I truly wish I knew how to resolve it for him. Anyway, I'm going to minimize these things. I'm going to keep an eye on the chat for any random questions. The show, and I'm looking forward for some potential spooky things to talk about. All right, spooky things uh, Michael is requesting. I, I like that uh, your connection, uh, since it only comes up properly when I switch over to this scene, uh, you're like, it's like that, uh, isn't there a movie where there's a guy who's, Dennis Quaid or someone's dead in a radio. I don't know. Anyway, that's what it reminds me of, like hearing signals from uh, uh, from beyond. So uh, with that in mind, I think that it would be fun to try to create something spooky since it is a Friday the 13th. Um, I would love suggestions as to what could be a fun and spooky thing to try to do if you are curious about anything in particular. And if not, I am likely going to just dive into... Uh, messing with Cinema 4D's exciting world of uh, physics sims and things like that, because they are a great way to get a lot of organic, free animation out of using simulations to your benefit. So I'll watch for any of your suggestions and comments and try to uh, work with that. And uh, if not, I'm going to start making up my own thing, which will be uh, just as lovely. Oh, in the meantime, I could actually show you, uh, speaking of... Uh, I don't know. Speaking of simulations, I got to put together a very silly <laughs> little teaser thing, uh, or what, not teaser thing. Uh, our business daddy, Nemechek Group, is celebrating 60 years together and wanted uh, some little uh, token of uh, excitingness. And so I can share that with you all here. Uh, but shh, don't, don't tell, don't spoil it for <laughs> The people at the Nemechek 60th anniversary party. Uh, let's see if I can switch over to here and play this thing if I can. Do, 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 do. All right, get excited. That's how we do it. That's how we like to celebrate here. So the end of this, I got to use one of my, my favorite things that you can do in uh, cinema, which is the this inflation thing. Now, uh, EJ Hassenfrost has been doing some amazing uh, uh, things with inflation. So I do... Uh, uh, no one loves inflation like EJ Hassenfrost is what I always say. But um, let, let's run through some of the kind of silly things going on in here. I'll press play on this again from the beginning. 
So we got our Maxon logo. Uh, it converts over to some like more rainbowy colored versions and then inflate like little balloons until they pop against each other. Uh, spreading this lovely, it's so happy, it's so fun, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and turn that off for now and switch over to uh, to this window. Uh, I'm going to uh, place myself a little bit, uh, where should I place myself in cinema? I'll place myself right here down the corner. I can watch all the fun activities, but you can still see the attributes panel uh, if you're zoomed in. So let's close down this. Let's close down this. And then uh, we're going to dive into Cinema 4D. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that the chat is being quiet at the moment. That or I've lost, I've lost touch with the, with the chat again, and it's still where it is. Let, make some noise if you're in there. Let me know what's up and what, what, is, the, what is the scariest movie you saw at a young age that was probably too young to have seen said movie. Uh, and in the meantime, I'm going to go over here into my object panel, and I'm going to uh, hold down on text, and I'm going to create a 3D bit of text right here, just like that. And let's say, um, well, I know, let's just do the word boo, right? I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of scary, right? All right. Now, What's neat is about this new text tool is that, I mean, it's been around for a little while, but instead of having to create a text spline and then extruding it and stuff like that, you can just create 3D text uh, right from the get-go like this. Now, one thing that's kind of weird about uh, text, if you wanted to convert it into a cloth and inflate it into balloons, um, you'd probably want something like a ground plane under it. And let's add a few colors in here just for uh, fun. I'm gonna switch. Um, I'm gonna switch to standard rendering <laughs> right now instead of Redshift, just because I've been having I've been having a day, you know. So let's put uh, this material on the ground, and we'll say maybe that's a, I don't know some kind of nice contrasty ground color, and then on these letters here we'll do a simple ghosty white color kind of thing. I'm going to raise them up off the ground a little bit like that. And then if I wanted to, I could just say uh, simulation tags, make this cloth, and then press play. And if I do that, uh, it'll fall straight through the ground there. But if I had remembered to go to the uh, plane before that and gone to simulation tags and say this is a collider, then I could press play. And you'll notice that Letters collapse like that, which is pretty cute, like little jello jigglers or something like that. Um, but I want something a little bit more exciting. And in the cloth simulation tag right here, uh, I'm going to move my uh, move my face out of the way so I can look right right over here at these lovely these lovely uh, properties of my cloth surface. Um, I can go over to balloon and check balloon yes, and then say I would like it to overinflate, like by a factor of three in 30 frames. And if I press play, I'll get sort of what we got in that other thing, but I'll show you a few things that I would recommend first. So I can press inflate, and they're going to try to inflate, and that one goes flying off in this weird direction. It's kind of wild. Um, one of the reasons why they're doing this bizarro thing is if I press uh, NB... Uh, it can reveal basically all of what my wireframe looks like. Now, when you're extruding text to begin with, um, it doesn't feel like it really needs a lot of subdivision because it's assuming you're just doing a logo or something like that. But if this is the structure of something that you're going to try to inflate like a balloon, uh, it's making the whole face just one big end gone, and that's kind of confusing for it. It's not very pretty. Uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, instead of just accepting uh, the, this kind of shape, I want them to be a little bit more uh, balloon-like. Now, there is the subdivision slider in uh, the text properties right here, but that doesn't do anything about the letter faces, really. So what I've been enjoying doing is knowing that if I want something to inflate like a balloon, that it would be better if it had a really nicely wrapped 
bit of uh, geometry around it. So I've been a big fan of the volume measure and the volume builder. So they work in tandem. So I can throw in a volume builder like this, and then I can throw, uh, I can either drag my text up into the volume builder, and you'll see it makes this nice uh, little volume out of it, which is pretty cool. Oh, let's see. Oh, so you can add, uh, Michael is mentioning, uh, Ghost Michael, that uh, you can add some uh, geometry to the face of the text. Uh, let me see. Uh, is it here in... Um, so using the cap... Oh, it's under the caps section here. So let's see. So... Oh, so there we go. That's pretty nice. Look at that. I can add some geometry like this. And then I could uh, go to my object and maybe do some subdivisions. Yeah, that's a pretty... Here, this is a pretty decent looking looking thing. I love that. Look at that. And now watch the difference between this overinflation and the previous version. Watch. Now we got some little inner tubes, and that's exciting. Now, what worked the best were the O's, and that's what I was looking at with the division. Because, like, look at that division. It's really great. Uh, the B, on the other hand, has this has this issue of not, not enough things again. So, so that's, again, where we want to uh, get back to uh, this volume builder idea. So say we had some letters like this. Uh, the volume builder you can either drag an object into if you don't really care about it anymore, or you can leave it out here in the open and select your volume builder and say, hey, I want this text to be a part of this without having to move it here. Uh, so either way, you can do it. This way, it keeps uh, this piece preserved and you can hide that and just stick with the volume builder. So you see what I've done? I've hidden this text, even though in the volume builder, it's referring to the text as a shape to bring in. Now, you can set the voxel count right now, it's at, or the voxel size right now, it was at 10 centimeters. I can set it down to something like five, and I'll get this sort of like rounded, voxely uh, looking thing. And I might start with uh, a number like that and throw this volume builder inside of a volume measure like this. And now look at that. We're sort of back to the original shape, but look at the distribution now of all of our points. It's very handy. I like that. So that's just straight coming from the volume builder at this voxel setting and the volume measure there. And then if you wanted to go another step further, uh, what's fun about the volume measure is that you can set the threshold range. So if it were down, it would make things skinnier. Uh, down to where you're basically getting nothing, or you could turn it up and it's sort of like inflating it. So it's this, it's this fun marshmallowing of the letters like that. And now they've got a lot of little points like that. And if I were to drag that uh, balloon uh, tag up to the volume measure, I can press play on this. And now you'll see, now everything is properly acting the way we had hoped, like a nice little like inner tube or something like that with some nice distribution of all the points. And one of the coolest things about having uh, Pixel Logic on board with all of this stuff is that inside of Cinema, we actually have the power of their remesher tool. So if I wanted to, I could even put this volume measure inside of uh, the remesh tool and look, look at this. This is beautiful. This is uh, this is absurd. Um, I do not know if I'm I'm seeing no new comments, and so I'm guessing that once again my comment stream has shut off. That or everybody is just stunned into silence by this amazing presentation. So um, you can see that the remesh tool has created these beautiful, beautiful divisions of everything like that. So now everything is very, very nicely round. If I were to put the balloon tag on this, I, I'm now getting like the most ideal version of this, as if these were all on like an equally spaced kind of cloth being affected by that, which is really, really fun. And it's also technically all non-destructive. It's this text layer informing the volume builder, informing the mesher, informing the remesher. And on top of all this, if you're ever working with text, 
Uh, you could technically always in the remesh tool go to uh, check this symmetric in Z button if you wanted to. Um, it might have actually technically been symmetric already, but uh, since front to back I wanted symmetric, I can check that. And now um, this will have these perfectly uh, wrapped UVs all, over, all around them, which is really, really cool. So now these are even more, more uh, evenly spaced. And if you had some letters, like uh, I just did it for the word maxon, and almost all of the letters except for the N uh, are both symmetric in X and in Z, which is really cool. And in Y, if you're talking about like the O and stuff like that. So uh, for me, I uh, assume that the more symmetric I can make these curves, just the better they're going to work um, when they're going into a simulation mode, just because you know that they'll behave the same way on the front and the back. So uh, here we go. We've got this uh, remesh uh, balloon situation going on here. And checking in. Oh, let's see. All right. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm <laughs> this, is the, this is the jankiest setup, but I'm getting screenshots of, the tech, of, the, of your, your lovely comments uh, from, from, Michael, from Michael the ghost in the machine sending me stuff. Uh, and I, I do have to call out uh, the amazing uh, uh, Justin Leduc with uh, booleans is what is what I should have called the ridiculous ridiculous Justin. All right, so let's go into uh, into our overpressure settings, and I'm going to turn them up to like ten. Uh, but I'm going to set the expansion time to a little bit longer. Let's say it takes. 113 frames, and uh, I'll expand my timeline a little bit like that. And now these should be these should go a little bit crazy. Let's see. Yeah. Look at that. They inflate. They go wild like that. But. One fun thing that like a real balloon would do is it's not going to take all of that abuse from being blown up like that. There's probably going to be a point at which its surface will tear. Uh, so if I enable cloth tearing, saying that if it's stretched past like 500%, um, it will tear. Then I can get this kind of fun effect. Inflate, 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 and... Oh, it didn't quite get there. I, I guess I'll need to make the tolerance a little bit lower. Okay, if it's if it gets past two hundred and fifty percent, we'll say, and play. Oh, that was too soon. <laughs> Sorry. Let's see. Let's try. It's almost fun to try to figure out where is where's the the perfect point for this. Uh, let's try four hundred percent is where they will pop. I'll press play. Inflate, inflate, and then at some point when they reach, they get too big, they should, oh my gosh, it's not, it's, it's somewhere in between there. Let's try 350 as the pop uh, moment, or the tearing moment. And now, boom. And they tear and they burst back down into this little thing like that. Now, one of the issues here, and one of the reasons why I'm getting everything kind of like contracting and falling back down into little shapes like that is because I am using this kind of non-destructive workflow where it's a volume mesher and uh, and the remesher and everything like that before it becomes cloth. But if I'm in love with this, uh, these lovely um, subdivisions, which I am, uh, I could also take this remesh and say current state to object. Just have this nice remesh object out here and drag my, oh, it actually copied the balloon thing right over to it already. So I'm going to hide uh, this uh, other remesh and everything like that and just use my, uh, not a rasterized, can you say rasterized in 3D? My uh, converted to geometry version of the letters here. Uh, I'm going to add the cloth tearing to them. I'm going to say uh, balloon overpressure is going to go up to, let's see, I want the overpressure to be 10, 
and I want the surface to tear if it gets past 300%. Whoops. And now that this is solid geometry, I think that I will get a cooler result from the tearing engine. Whoops. If, that is if. <laughs> what do we got here? I don't need that. Um, cloth, balloon. All right, do your thing, man. Boom. Those those were slightly disappointing tears. I don't like that. Okay, uh, simulation tags. I'm gonna start start from scratch. Let's do a balloon. Let's uh, overpressure it. And on the surface, let's say cloth tearing, tear past 171, and let's press play. That's kind of boring. It's like a flat tire. Um, it might be that I'm trying to do this, use the balloon <laughs> as the way to drive the tearing instead of something else. Let me see. Out of curiosity, if I were to add... Um, a simulation force like some uh, uh, maybe an attractor and I'll put the attractor right here in the middle of the letters and I'll actually set its strength to a negative value what would happen? <laughs> Nothing, that was weak. Weak or my let's see Michael did recommend a good point, which is that instead of uh, using the, uh, just checking the cloth tearing button, I could actually go to uh, my uh, MoGraph tool here, I think, and then I can go to a uh, MoGraph weight, weight paint brush here. Let me just uh, switch back to uh, not having to see that stuff anymore. And let me see if I... Can I paint on it? Um, what am I trying to do? I'm trying to do use the weight tool. No, not MoGraph. Uh, what am I doing? Simu. Oh, is it is it the weight tool in character? What am I trying to do? Oh, Michael is uploading me files now. Okay, here we go. Let's see. Let's see what Michael's got. Oh, look at that. Ooh, I like the... Uh, what on earth? Look at this. Oh, I deleted my vertex map tag a second ago. That's a cool effect. So what have we what have we here? We have the text spline uh, being extruded, volume builder, uh, and up here we have uh, uh, the balloon surface and uh, this uh, cool uh, random field pushing everything around. And then let's see what have we here? What is what is this do, Michael? Yes. Oh, it's gnarly. I love it. All right, let's find a good angle for this. Ka -ching, ka -ching. Look at this. It's like the Terminator's face. And I love this. This is great. Oh, yeah, I can just drag. <laughs> I love what little gummy bears these look like. With all of this going on. Whoops. Sorry. I broke it. Yes. You wanted spooky. And Michael, you delivered. I love this. In the meantime, I'm going to switch over and try to see if I can find... I, I, I miss... I miss getting to see all the comments with everybody. All right. 
Now I can at least sort of see some of these. Excellent. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, this is it is so fun that y'all are still sticking here with uh, this very ridiculous stream where we are messing around and have just just the most ridiculous uh, uh, technical issues going on. Anyway, I'm having a lot of fun with all of that stuff. Okay, what? Wh let's see. I think something that we were. Uh, we were playing with last week was uh, using the volume builder as a way to put a mesh on top of uh, a pyro object to get like goo and stuff dripping. And I feel like that could be a cool uh, effect that you could get out of this kind of a thing. Let me see. I'll close that. I'll close that. And uh, let's just, let's do it. Let's do a new one of these. And, uh, Let's see what's a what's a what's a spooky word that we could use. How about like um, I don't know blood. Very spooky. Um, let's pick a better font here. Eh, fine. Fine, whatever. Uh, let's do that. Let's put this in. A, let's roughly do the um, split up the caps a little bit. Make these round. Excellent. Gross. Silly. Uh, whatever. And I'm afraid, guys. I'm just. I'm still switching to my stuff to standard. All right, let's make this uh, some gross red blood with a... Yeah. So spooky. <laughs> All right, so we've got that going. And then uh, right here, I'll right-click on that and go to Pyro Fuel. Or actually, not Pyro Fuel, Pyro Emitter. Uh, simulation tags, pyro emitter. And then here in the pyro object, I'll go to my pyro scene. I'll turn on the density and temperature. And in the scene settings, I'm going to go to the pyro simulation and mm -hmm. its uh, buoyancy. And I'll turn that to like two on that and two on temperature. And if I press play, it's going to look like these little letters are sort of on fire oh, that didn't do what I thought oh I forgot I guess uh, the density buoyancy was correct but the temperature buoyancy needs to be negative right yeah that's what we need there we go so now we have this inverse fire blood letters right uh, but what this is really going to become after all of this is in the pyro scene, I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to say uncheck draw pyro. So if I were back at the beginning, you'll see this and I'm going to hide that there. I have draw pyro turned off and then I'm going to add a volume measure and put the pyro output inside of it. And now I've got this ridiculous thing and we'll put the... Uh, Oh, let's see. Oh, I can lose the temperature entirely, Michael is telling me. So maybe here in uh, my pyro object um, itself, I'm going to just turn off temperature and just stick with density. You are my density. Ew, gross. All right, let's see. Let's go to my pyro emitter here and let's see what uh, it's adding a lot of density to it so I turn that down to five okay not, not quite what I was hoping for uh, temperature add 
temperature set. What if I turn those down? This looks a little bit like popcorn or something like that. Let's see, I'll turn down the thickness of the uh, actual letters here. Ooh, now we're maybe getting somewhere. I better put my, my blood red on them already. Okay, now I think in my pyro output, I could go to the scene here. And let's go to the density dissipation and turn that up a little bit. So the density dissipates a little bit sooner. Here we go. This is what I was kind of after. And you know what I could throw into this is I could throw in a, uh, let's see, I'll just put some smoothing in here. Oh, yeah, there we go. Maybe too much smoothing. Okay, pyro, let's turn the... Uh, dissipation down a little bit more again. Gosh, it's so weird. It's just the... <laughs> oh yeah, we do need a floor object in here, don't we? Okay, so let's put a floor in here and let's say uh, simulation tags, collider object. So now you can have this uh, floor under here, except it's too small of a floor. It doesn't, it can't get all the blood. Make it wider. There we go. Okay, this is pretty fun. Oh, that's so weird. And if I were if I went to the um to the volume measure and or sorry to the uh, pyro output and played with the voxel size, you could get different effects. Like if I turned it down to voxel size of three, you'll get even extra like weird little details like that. And I could play with the temperature. Let's see, I turned the I'm not dealing with the temperature at all now, right? So it's just the density. So if I turn that value down, I should get heavier looking blood, I think. So yeah, so Pyro is definitely still trying to do a volumetric, like a, a fire kind of simulation. It wants uh, the the density of these to be able to like, to, uh, spread and dissipate as if they were uh, a gas. So this is definitely tricking it into doing something that it is not meant for. But uh, since uh, I don't have a, you know, a, another liquid solution in here, I really do like getting to use this to simulate some of the weird things that I want to try. Here's that. Let me play with the... Uh, and I mean, you could even have... Uh, the uh, the buoyancy be a negative number. Wait, oh, am I thinking of? Am I doing the wrong thing now? Oh, positive number, like it was before. Why aren't I getting a uh, flowing up blood now? We'll never know. We'll never know. <laughs> right. See, oh yeah, you could definitely scale the noise that's in here to get some uh, different effects here. So let's see. With the, uh, where is our noise? Dun, 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 dun. Okay, the turbulence, we've got the advanced temperature. Turn the scale up of these. This is likely going to get boring, everybody. 
Okay. I'm turning this back down to here. Anyway, a silly, uh, fun way to, uh, to play with, uh, pyro. All right. I'm going to call, I'm going to call it on this one since we sort of demonstrated this last week too. Oh man. Yes. Thank you all for tuning in. <laughs> Time is really flying on the stream today. I, I hope I hope that is as uh, meant to be as funny as as I feel. I, I'm in this mortified state of uh, of having all of my friends trapped in the in the upside down, and I can't let them speak to the stream. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. My goodness, what are we at? We're at. And we're almost an hour and a half into the show. I feel like this was was pretty darn fun. <laughs> Is there anything else that people are interested in uh, seeing on this spooky Friday the thirteenth, uh, or have we have we beaten this dead horse uh, long enough? Does it need to be put out of its misery? You all in the chat, let me know. See, Michael is shouting at me from beyond to grab uh, a Mixamo character, which I will do right now. Okay, Mixamo. Do you remember who I was? No! I was not logged out for more than 24 hours. Are you kidding me? Put some of your AI on identifying how recently someone logged in Adobe. That would be max cool of you. So it seems like the big uh, the big thing from uh, sneaks that everyone was talking about was uh, the uh, uh, what you call it the uh, project fast fill. This thing. I'm pulling this up, I don't think anyone can hear it. But here, here, here is I think the uh, the exciting thing from. Adobe Max that everyone liked was that uh, we figured out how to have generative fill for video, right? Everyone went bonkers over this. And where's the other example? Drawing a little thing around that and generating a tie on this piece of footage. All such exciting stuff that's coming down the pipe. But if you try to log into Mixamo... Sorry, it's it's again. Was was it Justin last week who said who said the best thing ever? All right, I'm gonna load up uh, a very simple character here. What uh, how about this uh, a mouse? I'm gonna grab this doozy character just because it's a, a unique shape. Yeah. And let's let's look for some kind of a running. Isn't there a running in a circle? Oh, I'm in character mode still. All right, Michael suggested that we get a uh, a Mixamo character and do something exciting with uh, smoke with it. Okay, that that's a less exciting motion than I thought it was going to be. That might be kind of cool. Hmm, I kind of want a looping kind of thing. Um, tour. <laughs> We've got salsa dancing. Uh, let's try. Let's try scary again. Let's just do this walk, and we'll do it. Uh, should we do it in place? No, we'll we'll have it over some time. Let's add a few frames to this since it's a, one of the looped ones that you can basically just add a longer frame to. Mm, 
All right, let's download this silly little mouse. We're going to try uh, using a, a silly little thing, uh, a little uh, particle emitter of sorts out of this. So let's uh, save this scary clown walk into today's uh, folder. Let's bring it here into uh, cinema. Animated elements and are you still downloading? Come on, download faster, Mixamo. All right, don't care about the textures or anything, but we've got this character. Uh, let's add. Uh, oh, do I still have this collider plane? Let's just copy the collider plane over here and make it a little bit bigger like that. And then uh, in this character, let's go ahead and say, uh, let's make you uh, some pyro emitter swords. Uh, on your pyro emission, I'm going to, now I'm going to hide the object that is you. I'm going to go to your pyro tag and... Um, See, I want for this pyro to have, do I need to unlock the takes to be able to modify it? Okay, yeah. Uh, since it was a Mixamo character, it had uh, it had the takes, the, the transformations locked button there. So I unlocked that so I can now access this stuff. Uh, for here, for the temperature, I'm just going to set the temperature to like 1,000 instead of uh, 4,000, and I'm just going to press play and see what happens. Excellent. That should keep it in kind of a smoky realm, not not too hot. And then here in the uh, pyro output, I'm going to say the buoyancy for the temperature should be negative. So it falls down from them like that. There we go. And I'm going to also hide the uh, hide the skeleton. And now I've got a cool, cloudy... Gummy bear monster thing walking around. Okay, I kind of dig this. Uh, let's go to the pyro settings and play with the uh, the voxel size. Let's see uh, how upset uh, the computer gets at me for a voxel size of three pixels. Now, keep in mind for any of these simulations that you do, uh, you can set your you know voxel size to something that's giving you a nice bit of output, and then export this VDB so you can get uh, do some cool uh, redshift shading on it. I just want that walking motion to go on longer. This feels like a really cool force to like be coming to destroy a city. Let me look at its temperature settings again. Uh, maybe I'll turn down the temperature even more to like the 500 realm. Let me see what that gives. There we go. Now we're never almost exclusively in smoke. Look how fun this is. Just a free little Mixamo download emitting pyro in here. It's pretty cool. Now I wonder if, uh, you also had the simulation tag of, a collider on the body geometry. What would that do? Would that give you extra uh, smoke interaction that's falling and bouncing off of the shape as if it's moving through it? Kinda. That's pretty cool. And speaking of weird cool things you could do. I'm actually curious uh, if you had, uh, if you went to Moves by Maxon and you had some lovely, uh, uh, oh, it looks like I only have this one face capture anymore. I'd, what happened to my old face captures? I don't have a scary one. I'm just going to go with this one. This is, uh, this is my, uh, Landing on the ground and then uh, looking, uh, looking happily around like this, all excited. 
And that may look familiar <laughs> because it is, in fact, uh, uh, this thing. All right, watch, watch the performing on, on this Velociraptor right here. Looks down, jumps up, little little eyebrows looking around. That's all being ported over from this uh, very silly uh, moves by Maxon capture that I did, which is fun. So now we can just we can act out what we want the Velociraptor to do, and it'll it'll do that for us. Uh, check out our um, I can't remember what it was called episode. It has it has a picture of uh, a singing Velociraptor on it. Um, but, uh, I'm going to take this geometry and, uh, see what happened. You know what? Let's see. What time is it? We have, we have some time. I'm going to capture a new, a new motion that is l less, less silly here for that specific purpose. All right. Uh, we're going to, I'm going to do some exciting acting everybody. So, so here we go. I've got my, uh, moves by Maxon app right here opened up and pointed at my face here and we're just going to do a big <laughs> a big something scary face all right and here we go we're going to go Rawr. 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 Ow. hi all right we're going to do that and then we're going to uh Jump over here. I'm going to send that to uh, the computer. And now I think that I can just open up uh, Moves by Maxon. It'll be right here. Import that. Let's delete uh, the one from the other day. Now I have uh, this exciting mesh moving around, which is pretty cool. And I'm going to try adding uh, my pyro tag to this simulation tag, pyro emitter. Let's have it be a, uh, let's also add, let's see, let's go to my pyro settings. Let's say the temperature is. We are not seeing your screen, sir. Oh, we're not? not? Oh, yeah, screen. I forgot. <laughs> I didn't switch over. Thank you, Michael. I'm, uh, I, I forgot to switch back to this screen. Um, I replaced the, uh, <laughs> um, more with the eyes, says Frigby. Goodness, how am I get? How am I gonna get through this? Here, you know what? We'll we'll add some uh, eye expression to this. That will hopefully satisfy that a little bit. All right, so uh, so here we go. We've got this little little silly performance. Uh, oh whoa! Oh, I'm gonna need a much uh, smaller voxel size for this. Let's try size two. And then let's go to our uh, output here, and we'll say set timeline to frame count from the Moves by Maxon app. And then here on my pyro output, I'll say the voxel size is 2 centimeters. And on my pyro tag, I'm going to say that the thickness is just 2 centimeters. And hopefully that gives me a reasonable compromise. Oh, and I also don't want to see my face. Okay. We're getting something. It's too small, or, you know, rather the, the voxels are too uh, too large to get detail off of this shape yet. So I'm going to turn the voxel size down to one centimeter, and now let's see what we've got. Okay. Now we have a bit of definition going on. Maybe I do need to turn the thickness up on the uh, emitter. I really don't want it to have to be. I don't want the thickness of the object to distort the smoke too much. And uh, right now I'm just using the default like built-in uh, pyro-looking shader. So let me see if I can uh, just rotate the whole thing around a little bit to benefit from the lighting here. Okay, so we've got something going on. You can see some of the shape of my face. We need we need less thickness. Okay. 
and then uh, voxel size. Let's see. So Michael's suggesting that uh, we mess with the noise. Let's mess with the noise. Okay. Um, let's see the relative scale. What if it were much lower? Relative scale. Wait. Now, if I turn it to zero, do I get just a very smooth, boring output from that? What do I get? Okay. Pyro output. First of all, I'm going to go to the pyro scene, and I want the density to disperse faster. So it's not taking so long. And then I want to go to my uh, buoyancy and set it to zero on these things. And so it's just sort of like a hovering around bit. Okay, interesting. <laughs> I'm not quite getting there yet. Okay, 0.5 centimeter pixels. Basically, this is a, this is a smaller <laughs> object than I thought. Okay. Smaller object than I thought, and the thickness is too high on the object. Okay, let's just say one centimeter thick. Okay, now we're getting a little bit of definition from the face itself. So yeah, we're somewhere in between that, uh, whatever, the, the Voldemort signal and the, the mummy here. Now, in theory, if I scale my moves by maxon thing, couldn't I turn the voxel size up and then scale the whole, uh, let me see. I don't remember if you can scale the moves by maxon object like that. Yes, you can. <laughs> yes. This isn't what I wanted at all, but, it, but, but isn't it though? <laughs> no idea what I've done now. You know what? I don't I don't care. It's perfect. And make this bigger. I'm going to delete the eyes. And then I'm gonna hide this again and let's just see what we got going. No, it didn't keep the didn't keep the resized thing go. Okay, we're getting a little bit bigger now. Okay, now what if the uh, if the face also pushed the smoke? Is that helpful? Or is that to slow it down too much? This is really bizarre. If it wasn't clear that I don't know what I'm doing, uh, hopefully it, it becomes rapidly apparent. I think that I want some negative buoyancy again, because I just, I kind of dig the falling, the waterfall kind of effect of smoke. So let's turn the temperature buoyancy to a more negative number, so it's kind of falling down from the face. That's kind of cool. I don't know what I'm doing, ladies and gentlemen, and anyone in between. This is just uh, a, a very silly, almost spooky effect, but uh, I feel like it's gone gone horribly awry, horribly awry. I also now have a... Uh, uh, my my lovely dog Bumblebee is hanging out in here with me, but uh, has decided that <laughs> she's had enough of my Cinema 4D antics. All right, well, let's see. Let's go to our simulation forces. Let's add a bit of wind. I feel like if you're shooting like a music video or something cool, you'd always have wind blowing in your face and that's what that's what I need to for this star power to really shine through. Let's turn this wind 
around. Whoops. I'm going to point it at the face and go to the wind settings. Turn up the wind factor to, let's try 100. Starting at the beginning, is 100 enough? I think I need more. There we go. Okay. All right, now we're getting a little bit more of a cool defined thing out of this. I'm going to go back to my noise settings in Pyro and turn that back up a little bit more again. Turn up the animation speed on the noise. You know, we're almost halfway close to something cool. <laughs> yes, it's a bit voxely, but uh, who isn't these days, you know? Pyro output. I'm going to try slightly bigger voxels just to see if I get cooler smoke shapes for just a moment. And no, not really. Okay. Well, this was this was almost neat in the way that I wanted it to be neat, but also a, a little a little lame in the end. It's it's so close to almost something cool. I'm just missing a few a few good components that could that could really bring it to life, which is why. Uh, as we move forward on the show, we'll definitely have uh, the input of uh, better people. And we'll even let the people who are on the show hosting it speak during the show. This is kind of cool. I kind of like where this is landing now. I'm going to see what happens if I turn off my collider tag so I'm not trying to have the mesh push any of the smoke around. It's pretty neat. If I if I if I output this VDB and then render it with Redshift, I could actually get something pretty cool out of this. You could probably even find the right point where you could get uh, the smoke to look a little bit like hair. Like if it were pointing a little bit down in the back like this. So I just have this nice like ponytail of hair. It's pretty cool. It's very clear that uh, the uh, uh, you could get uh, some really cool results if you cache this whole thing through. And uh, one of the new advantages of uh, being able to cache a cool simulation like this is being able to up the exact uh, simulation you have instead of having to uh, uh, sacrifice losing that whenever you try to switch to a different size of something. But uh, here is, I think, where I'm going to leave everyone today on this lovely Friday the 13th with this uh, silly, uh, silly smoky uh, pyro head that uh, I'm going to learn a little bit more about uh, how I could render this out in a cool-looking fashion and also maybe some ways to uh, reduce the overall uh, look of uh, the, uh, just the voxeliness uh, up here. It's, it's a little bit high, I would uh, want to try to improve that as time went on. But uh, let's see. Uh, one last question uh, from Justin Leduc is, uh, what happened to office hours? Are we still doing them? Uh, we would love to do them. Uh, I think that what has happened recently is uh, we had a very busy summer for uh, everybody. And so our office hours were us desperately trying to get the show together and a little bit less... Uh, narratively entertaining like when we're trying to solve a problem or something like that but um, I don't think office hours has gone away I think it just will be uh, an opportunistic thing uh, just like now so stay subscribed stay tuned in and uh, maybe I'll uh, I'll I'll turn on uh, let's see I've got to turn off the simulation it's uh, it's kind of killing me right now um, but uh, maybe I can uh, next week show a little preview of uh, the intro that I that I had hoped to show today, uh, 
because it would have mildly been on theme, but I think it'll be even cooler if it's done properly. So uh, anyway, with that, happy Friday the 13th, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to VFX and Chill. Uh, I believe that uh, next week we are here with uh, Territory Studios to show off some cool stuff. So please tune in for that. Uh, they'll have some uh, lots of cool materials to show off. And uh, I think the gang is back. The gang is all back around next week. So that should be lovely. Oh, let's see. What's... Uh... <laughs> I'm just I'm just reading reading Michael's comments. <laughs> okay, lovely, lovely. All right, well, everybody, uh, definitely be ready for this spooky season. Send us all of your spooky suggestions. Uh, Michael, I'm going to hold on that comment to say uh, for the moment. But uh, uh, please do uh, send anything at, at us uh, on the social media out there at Red Giant News or Maxon or, uh, you know, me, Michael, and Seth uh, individually on whatever social media apparatus uh, is your preferred way today. Make requests and we'll make some cool shows for you. Uh, thank you, everybody. Have a lovely weekend, and we'll see you all next week on VFX and Chill. So when I'm seen, you got a little longer, so it seems. I bring out, so to speak. I come a little closer. I feel a little light in the light track.